You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. The housing market has been running up against a lot of obstacles, but nothing seems to be slowing this wild real estate market. Prices have continued to rise while buyers clamor after a tight supply of homes. Today's guest will talk about the crazy demand for housing and how that might play out in the coming year. I'm Kathy Fedke, and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. Danushka Nanayakara Skillington is the Assistant Vice President of Forecasting and Analysis for the National Association of Home Builders. She oversees research into the housing market, including industry surveys and various forecasts for national, regional, long-term, and remodeling expenditures. And she's here with us on The Real Wealth Show to share her insights. Danushka, welcome to The Real Wealth Show. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you for having me. What an interesting time to be in the home building business. <laughs> it's crazy out there. Yeah. So what is going on? I mean, we, we knew that there were lumber shortages, but now it seems like there's shortages on all kinds of things. Can you just kind of give your input on that, your perspective on what's going on with the supply chain? Yeah. So, yeah, so lumber was a big issue last year. And even this year, I think it peaked in July and lumber prices were adding like $36,000 to a single family home and $10,000 to an apartment. Prices were insane and it went down actually, but it's the other stuff, you know, that goes into residential construction so inputs to residential construction is up 22% year over year. So, you know, steel and wood products are driving up the prices. And not only that, so the builders are saying there's shortages in appliances, every type of pretty much building construction, and also, you know, everything that goes into a house. So there's so much of um, wait time, long delivery time, so, yeah, I think in a nutshell, I think it's fair to say that the supply chains are a mess <laughs> and the builders are really feeling it because, you know, 2022 was a crazy year um, with these renewed interest in housing. So the demand just skyrocketed and, you know, the builders are trying to meet that demand, but the supply side is the biggest um, obstacle to it right now. Yes, and now we've got we're hearing about all these shipping containers sitting on the ocean, not being able to unload. Uh, just another another issue yep. here. I, I I don't expect you to have the answers to everything, but I'm just wondering if you know why why are all these shipping containers sitting there with the things that we need? You know, I also read that article last week that came out like seventy something ships in LA, twenty something ships in Georgia. And they've never seen that happen before. And I have no idea um, <laughs> why. All I read was that we need to get Christmas shopping done ASAP. <laughs> That's what I read. <laughs> yeah, it's just something about the lack of workers or increased demand. Uh, I guess we all need to get, uh, but the bottom line is those materials and supplies, may, it may not be a shortage so much as an ability to get it to who needs it yeah. at this time. And and exactly. what, a, what a challenging time for builders who have never had so much demand. So where are we now in, in demand? Our, our, um, is, demand is, is demand today as high as it has been over the past year or is it starting to wane? I think the demand is there. I think, um, I think the buyers are pulling back a little bit because of the high house prices. But I think the demand is coming from the demographic shift um, that we are seeing. You know, the millennials are in their peak home buying years. Um, you know, we define peak home buying years as 25 to 45. So they are in the peak home buying years. And also the housing deficit, the chronic underbuilding that we've seen in the last decade is also what's contributing to this demand for housing. and. Uh, yeah, so they are pulling back a little bit right now simply because of the, you know, mentioned uh, the high house price, but there's not a lack of demand right now. And that's really a challenge, right, to bring in affordable housing at this time yeah. when material costs have gone up so much and labor costs and permit fees and 
Uh, mm-hmm. The delay time. I mean, you know, when it when a project is delayed, that is not a free deal for the builder. They usually have debts to pay during that time, uh, and and the profit margins get squeezed anyway. Then if if pricing hits a cap of affordability, people just can't can't afford uh, the cost of a home because it's become so expensive to build it. What do you do? Mm-hmm. It's a catch twenty two. We need more housing. We need it to be affordable, but costs are just simply really high. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so on the supply side, you know, we cover the building materials. The lack of skilled labor is is uh, driving up labor costs. Regulatory costs you just mentioned makes up almost a quarter of a house price right now. Um, and then you know the lending issues also are you know for especially for small builders that makes up majority of home builders. If the lending conditions are tighter, it's hard for them to get financing. Um, so yeah, uh, <laughs> it's mm-hmm. a it's a big uh, you know, and the lot shortage too. Uh, the availability of lots. So when there is a shortage of lots, what happens is the lot values increase. So the so because of all these, you know, the the cost of construction has gone up, and affordability is at um, the lowest point right now in a decade. Uh, at NHB, we measure that by the NHB Wells Fargo Housing Opportunity Index that at, at 57. So what 57 means is only 57% of the existing new and existing homes are affordable to a typical family. And a typical family makes a median income of $80,000. So yeah, so affordability is in the forefront for sure. Yeah. So are you seeing builders succeed at uh, supplying affordable housing at this point? So I think um, entry-level housing, it's kind of hard to measure. So I think an interesting stat to look at is that, you know, a house that built below, uh, the price below $30,000 for new construction. So in August, it was around 30% of new home sales a price below 30,000. So compared to 2019, there were 43% of new home sales were that were uh, priced below 300,000. So you can see that we don't have um, much affordable stock right now. Yeah, which is just going to maybe drive the price of existing homes up even more since yes. new homes <laughs> can't be built yeah. affordably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what, what, with all that in mind, the difficulty with builders getting homes complete, they might have some of the materials, but not all the materials and they can't get their CO until they have everything, including the appliances mm-hmm. that they can't get. And sometimes the appliances come and there's one little piece missing and that's going to be another six weeks before that piece shows up. So delays, delays, delays. Again, builders have holding costs that cuts into their profits. What do you see the inventory situation looking like in 2022? So, <laughs> so we are thinking um, for this year, you know, single family starts to be around 1.1 million. Uh, currently, existing home sales are only at 2.6 month supply. New home sales are at a balance at 6.1 um, month supply right now. But we have a deficit. Um, a housing deficit. So at NHB, we estimated about a million, um, and plus we calculate the 1.5 million uh, auxiliary drilling units as well. And then Freddie Mac estimated to be like 3.8 million housing deficit. NAR estimated to be like 5 million. So regardless, everybody, mm-hmm. you know, everybody agrees that there is a housing deficit. So inventory is low simply because of that mismatch of the supply and the demand. And we, the you know, the issues in the supply side is not going to be fixed right away. So I think there is going to be a mismatch for demand supply next year too. And that could drive prices up further. Do you think? Yeah. So this year we estimate uh, we expect um, um, home price to go to be around fifteen percent, but I think it's going to stabilize next year around 5% growth, um, simply because of the pullback from demand a little bit. And um, hopefully, um, you know, there will be more 
um, you know, like turnover, essentially some people like move up bars, you know, they're selling their starter homes and going to a bigger home. Hopefully there'll be a little bit better inventory next year and that should help stabilize the prices. Okay. Um, so again, it's so funny because it was just a few years ago that there was headline news that all these baby boomers were going to be downsizing and there would be this flood of homes on the market. And I remember kind of scratching my head and thinking, you know, this, these baby boomers aren't like baby boomers of the past, or like seniors in the past. They're very athletic. Uh, they've, they've got, you know, not all of them, but they, they have some savings. They want to stay at home. They, especially after the last two years, they're not keen on going into nursing homes. So we, we see people living longer. How, how did we, how did economists miss this? In other words, there was this concern that there would be a flood of homes on the market and it's just the opposite. I think that shows you that, you know, we are not perfect in <laughs> uh, quantifying uh, human behavior. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I think pandemic, um, the COVID-19 pandemic was really different to any economic situation that we've seen before. Uh, it was really hard to grasp the um, uh, what the economy is going to look like and also what the consumers and then the buyers and home buyers, what we really want, right? What everybody wants. And you're right. Uh, baby boomers are not downsizing. We are seeing a demand for multi-generational homes now, so bigger homes. And people are using their homes for uh, more purposes right now. You know, young people are living with their parents longer. And also on the remodeling expenditure side, I think our um, surveys are showing too that they demand for aging in place work as well. So that shows that the baby boomers are actually staying in their houses without um, selling it and um, downsizing it. And um, we, we were expecting that the 55 plus, like, you know, much time they would move to like the cities or some co- communities. And I think um, COVID-19 pandemic, I think, freaked everyone out. No one yeah. wants to live so closely with, next to each other, uh, to other people. So, you know, everybody wants to live in their own house and <laughs> yeah. be at arm's length. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, if you're, you're staying in a luxury condo and, and you don't get to use the amenities or you're stuck in an elevator with other people. And Yeah. Yeah, exactly. there's a lot of changes that took place. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, we know that builders are, I should say, uh, let's see, institutional funds are flooding to build to rent, uh, build, building communities that are horizontal apartments, because that's really what people want. They want a yard for their dogs and for their children. And, and uh, in case, in case we just see variant after variant and we're all stuck at home again, they want to know that they've got a nice place to be. Uh, so what is the impact of the build to rent? I've heard some people say we're really turning into a renter's nation. I mean, would you, would you agree with that? Um, not really, because build for rent share is still small. Um, when you look at the single family market, uh, we think it's around five to seven percent of single family starts. I mean, I mean, there is room to grow for sure. Um, there are larger estimates, but we use the census and the NHP surveys to compute our estimates. Um, you know, the single family bill for rent is a um, good solution for people who are not ready to buy yet, but who need additional room for like, you know, more room for their home housing needs. So yeah, you know, there's so much, you know, you hear this on the news a lot saying that, you know, everything is going to be built for rent. I don't think it's that, I don't think we agree with that um, to that extent. Mm -hmm. We think it's still a niche market, small market, um, could be rising, um, but not to, the levels, I think, what a lot of other people are estimating it to be. Not not making such an impact that, uh, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Okay, now interest rates, that really could slow down things if, if prices are going up and then interest rates go up and the cost of a home, or I should say the mortgage becomes that much more, that could uh, have an effect on the market. Do you anticipate mm-hmm. that interest rates will rise next year? Yes, uh, we do. And I think even... Um, 
the last in you know, the recent weeks also the interest rates have gone up a little bit and um yeah we do think because the fed is going to tighten the monetary policy and i think um 2018 was a really good example um to see what happens when the interest rate right? i think we saw housing soft patch um and kind of flat conditions when the interest rates were increasing so yeah um definitely um interest rates will rise but you know it's still at historic lows when you look at the rates that were in the 90s um we don't anticipate the rates going to those levels at all right yeah it did, did there was quite a bit of a slowdown for new home builders and that that again has me concerned that it will exacerbate the problem if builders are already squeezed on margins what's the incentive to build you're, you're not going to build homes that you lose money on so if if rent if uh, interest rates go up and therefore the market slows down and maybe prices soften there just won't be incentive to build more unless there's a way to build cheaper and maybe that's maybe that's coming who knows maybe once we get past this supply chain issue prices will come back down and labor won't be so expensive and uh, they'll be able to build more affordably at that time, but well, time will tell, right? Time will tell, exactly. <laughs> I think it'll be a good conversation to have next year, this time, to see yes. how things have changed or if it has changed at all. Yes. Oh well, it being. Um, let's see. You are the assistant vice president of forecasting and analysis. That's that's quite a job, right? Wow, that is a <laughs> that's a big job. So let's say, do you think there's any? chance that we could be overbuilding. In other words, we we do know that there's a really large cohort cohort of millennials turning home buying age. But then what after that? Like let's say 2015. Like if I if I went out and bought 20 homes today <laughs> to rent out, would I be having trouble renting those out in five years? Okay. So I think the uh, good way to look at that is the population profile in the country. So millennials are the largest living generation. You know, they make up 27% of the population. Then comes the Gen Zs. And Gen Zs are a smaller cohort compared to the millennials. So I think the millennials are much like the baby boomers. You know, large cohorts make big impact, right? And the Gen Zs are something close to probably the Gen Xs. Now, you know, they're smack in the middle of large cohorts. Um, so I think the fall and also the falling birth rate as well across the country, that could mean uh, lower housing demand in about 10 to 15 years. Not in the next five years, but I think the long term, 10 to 15 years, we could see a slowdown um, in the demand for housing. Mm, fascinating. Are there parts of the country that are growing faster than others and where housing is needed more desperately than other areas? Yeah, so I think the South is a, you know, half of the home building takes place in the South. It's the weather, the retirement communities are a huge attraction for home building. The West, you know, has always had high demand for housing. Um, so I think if you think about it, uh, we need more affordable housing on the West Coast, on the West, um, the Western states for sure. High population, not much um, housing stock. So the house prices are rising much faster in that area for sure. So we need housing and uh, maybe even better zoning rules mm -hmm. uh, in those states. And yeah, I think the larger states, you know, the uh, southern uh, cities like Atlanta, Dallas, Tampa, the Phoenix, those are large, uh, big markets that we expect lots of growth um, in the next couple of years. So I think also yeah. the hybrid, um, not hybrid, the telecommuting um, that uh, people took on last year has also spurred immigration to those large uh, markets as well. And um, we will see a lot of uh, uh, demand for housing in those markets. Yeah, I don't know if you can speak to this question because it's it's very local, but I always thought it was strange that just two to three, maybe four hours out of San Francisco, uh, there hasn't been a lot of growth. There's a lot of land um, in the you know Chico area, in Redding, in Oroville, 
And uh, we just haven't seen these retirement communities pop up the way we do in Arizona. Perhaps it's because of the tax laws, you know, maybe retirees would rather be in Arizona if they're going to deal with hot weather. <laughs> Let's go to Arizona yeah. instead of Reading. Uh, but yeah, I just found that interesting when you say we should be developing the West Coast. There's a whole lot of places on the West Coast that have not been developed and that are still pretty affordable, but just not of interest. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I could speculate a little bit. I would say California has um, different regulatory, like, you know, land development rules, probably compared to Arizona. That probably is a big factor uh, with zoning um, rules. That could be a big thing. And also, who knows, maybe Arizona has everything retirees hope for. So Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, if you if you don't have to pay state income tax as a retiree, that's a big bonus if you're on a fixed exactly. income for sure. So if you're going to choose, yeah, you'd probably just go over the border, uh, go go over to yeah. Nevada or yeah, okay, Nevada or Arizona. And I don't think Arizona is um, no state income tax, but I think it's lower at least. So okay, well, that makes a lot of sense. And yes, I agree with you. The cost to build in California is so expensive. With our project in Dublin years ago, I think it was one hundred and twenty thousand dollars just for the school fees and all the permit fees, <laughs> just before you can wow. even get started on development. Like, how do you create affordable housing in that scenario? Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Well, it's been really a pleasure to have you here on the on the Real Wealth Show. Any last thoughts for our listeners? They're mostly. Um, buy and hold investors, they buy properties and rent them out? Uh, I think, you know, we are in a very exciting um, year. You know, in the last couple of years, like, you know, 2020, 2021, the next couple of years too, very exciting for housing. Uh, you know, we've never expected this amount of interest and demand for housing. So I think it's just a matter of like we sorting out the supply side issues in order to meet this rising demand. So I hope we can, you know, rise up to the challenge. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you again so much for being here on The Real Wealth Show. I hope to have you back thank next you year. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. You can also check out new trends for real estate investors by joining our network for free at realwealthshow.com. As a member, you'll have access to our investor portal where you can view property pro formas and connect with our network of resources including experienced investment counselors, property teams, lenders, 1031 exchange facilitators, CPAs who specialize in real estate, and much more. And when I mean much more, I mean over 500 webinars that are free that will teach you the ins and outs of being a successful real estate investor. And in return, all we ask is that you subscribe to our podcast and leave a review because it makes a huge difference for us in our rankings. I'm Kathy Fedke, and thanks for listening to The Real Wealth Show. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.